Hello dear listeners and thank you all for tuning in. I am thrilled to be able to introduce one of the keynote speakers of the conference, Professor Charles Hillman, who also happens to be the guest of today's episode. After receiving his PhD at the University of Maryland, he was a professor at the University of Illinois for many years and currently teaches at Northeastern University in Boston, both at the Department of Psychology and the Department of Physical Therapy, Movement and Rehabilitation Sciences. He is a leading specialist on the subject of how physical activity affects our brains and cognitive abilities. In his life, he has published hundreds of journal articles on the links between exercise and general well-being and performance of individuals, especially when it comes to children. If you would like to know how exactly staying active keeps our brains and minds happy and healthy, why is it especially important for children to engage in physical exercise, whether our breathing technique affects potential benefits of exercise, and how to exactly reap those benefits in the most efficient and effective way, stay tuned and keep listening. Okay, hello. We are very, very happy to have a special guest into our uh, special edition of our podcast from the Neuronus Conference, Professor Charles Hillman. Good morning, good afternoon. Thank you for having me, Anna. Uh, Do you want to say something about you, about your scientific work? Sure. Let's see. I'm a professor at Northeastern University where I co-direct the Center for Cognitive and Brain Health, and my Research revolves around the focus of uh, physical activity effects on brain health and cognition in children, but also across the lifespan. Okay. Do you want maybe to tell us and our listeners some maybe funny story, maybe some anecdote from your scientific life? Maybe some oh. core memory? Oh boy. Uh, yeah, actually, I have a good one for you. So I, I began my career studying older adults instead of children. And around the time my, my own son was born, I was living in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, which is very cold in the winter. It's where the University of Illinois is. Mm-hmm. And he was probably two to three years old. And we went to this kid pit. If uh, I don't know if you have this here, but you know, it's that sort of area where kids play in the mall. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, it's disgusting carpet area. And and actually my my first real thought into this field of studying kids, this wasn't done back in the early 2000s. Everything was focused on adult, you know, adult cognition was that I I sat watching my kid play, but I sat watching the other children play where, you know, some of them were running around like little lunatics and having fun and others were just sitting very quietly and just petting the the wall. Mm -hmm. And they were sensation seeking, but not in the same regard. And I began to wonder about individual differences in exercise behavior and whether we could detect those differences during, you know, what I would consider to be a critical period of of brain development. And so my thoughts began to revolve around whether or not physical activity could help shape brain development. And that was what led to our first study in in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. Okay. So So, um, the next question is going to be a very general one, but I want you to just pick one or two Mm -hmm. general thoughts, main thoughts you have just came across your mind. Why our brains, the children brains and our adults brains needs physical activity? Well, I, I think our brains need constant stimulation. Not to say that we, we can have periods of non-stimulation, but I, I believe that we you know that our brains grow and develop and network within itself through stimulation. And and exercise is one one area that provides stimulation. What's unique about exercise and movement um, is that our species developed to be mobile. We, we developed to be physically active as a species. You know, long before our society was developed, we were hunters and gatherers, and we had to spend energy to get energy, right? Meaning we had to go out and move in order to find food. We had to move in order to find shelter. You know, we, we had to move in order to uh, not be hot lunch, right? Not to be preyed upon. And so I think the movement areas that develop to support that aspect of of our species 
began to become closely tied to the areas of the brain that supported higher order cognition and memory, which allowed us to remember where the predators were, where the food was, where we could seek shelter. And so I think that throughout the course of evolution, our brains came to require support in those behaviors, which is largely focused around movement. Mm -hmm. So do you believe that we live to move or we move to live? Oh, let's see. That's an interesting question. Probably a bit of both saying, giving the mm -hmm. safe answer, but I think that our brains in order to be healthy need movement. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So now I want to slightly go to the area of our well-being because okay. it's a general <clears throat> knowledge that after moving, mm -hmm. we most of the time feel better than before exercising. Mm -hmm. In what cases moving can be prescribed as an element of a therapy? And I'm saying about mm. psychotherapies or maybe a therapies as a recovery from some uh, trauma, injuries, etc. when it sure. comes um, directly to the nervous system. Yeah, well, I'm not a clinician, so I'm not prescribing any sort of therapies mm -hmm. here. Um, maybe it's my disclaimer, I should say that right away. I, I think there's a number of different clinical therapies that have potential through movement. You know, I think from, uh, you know, the ones you've mentioned, we know that exercise benefits depression and anxiety. It benefits recovery during post-concussion period. Mm -hmm. But having said that, you know, we have to be very careful because that kind of movement is a very low intensity movement that occurs. You don't want to raise heart rate above a certain threshold. You know, I'm familiar with school districts and principals who've taken some of my work and actually brought a treadmill into the principal's office So the kids who act out because of ADHD or other behaviors that, that would have them act out in the class, they actually now seek out the treadmill when they start to act out. And so I think that there's some substitution therapy there that's possible. And then I think certain forms of exercise, particular or social forms of exercise, are probably very good for people subclinically who, who aren't very good at uh, meeting others or don't want to go to a dating app or to the bar or something like that. And so I think that there's... Certainly, um, social aspects to our society that are, that are benefited through exercise. Okay. You mentioned few effects of physical activity on different age groups. Could you describe how does physical exercise benefit the minors with their brains? Minors. So, minors, uh, in terms yeah. of... Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's really the, you know, where most of my research sits. And, you know, from the work we've done in my laboratory, we've shown that being physically active, being more fit being engaged in an intervention of physical activity benefits brain structure in children. Uh, that is that we see changes in both gray matter and white matter in selective regions of the brain, not globally. Um, those regions of the brain support executive functioning, they support aspects of memory, uh, they support academic performance. We see effects on brain function. We see it across multiple different measures as well. We see it in the electric system of the brain, We see it in the uh, hemodynamic system of the brain, so blood flow. From these changes in brain function, we see that these effects are, again, selective to specific regions of the brain or networks of the brain that are involved in executive functioning and memory and achievement. And so we're starting to see sort of convergence of our structure and functional measures. Mm -hmm. So if physical activity does influence cognitive functions, do physical impairments hinder cognitive functions as well? So the way around? Yeah, that's a very good question. And that's something that we're just starting to investigate, I think, as a field. And that is to say that we're not interested in physical activity. These people aren't interested in physical activity. They're interested in physical inactivity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we all like to talk about the COVID pandemic. But the fact of the matter is, is that the physical inactivity pandemic has been a global crisis for almost two decades now. Uh, we're moving far less than ever before. And, uh, you know, if you listen to the work of Dominique uh, uh, Pindis today, actually a, a graduate of your program here, or of your university, she is studying the effects of physical inactivity on poor brain function. And so my own work on obesity, which is also a, in part a physical inactivity mm -hmm. issue, it's certainly a metabolic issue, and being physically inactive leads to metabolic dysfunction, you know, we do see effects on, on brain function and cognition as a function of being overweight or obese or physically inactive. Mm -hmm. So I think certainly this is an area that's going to get a lot of attention in the coming years. Okay, so, so I also wanted to ask you how it happens that even if usually we feel good after workout, it can happen that we don't feel any change. For example, because we are 
clinically depressed, anxious, etc. Because of our mental state, how it happens in brain. Yeah, so I mean, the work in my lab shows that, that following even moderate bouts of exercise, we do see benefits in attention inhibition, in some cases working memory. And so I think there is times where we perform better cognitively, but don't necessarily have that feeling, that subjective feeling of performing better. From an emotional perspective, I think it's a little more complex. I mean, certainly there are times where maybe you've had a rough day and exercise is great and you feel great afterwards. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, it's a very complex issue because I think it has to do with the type of exercise and what you like. I mean, I can tell you right now that if I go for a three-mile run, I don't feel good afterwards. I don't like to run. I just don't like it. So Okay, and it has changed, right? Because you, you no, used I was to like it? I was never a runner. Oh, okay. No, so, I hate okay. running. <laughs> running. Running through people who don't want to... Don't know how to play ice hockey, All right. right? And I like I love playing ice hockey. I can have the worst day of my life, go play ice hockey, forget about everything. So from mm -hmm. a distraction perspective, I feel better, right? Same thing, you know, it's a social environment. Maybe the social aspects of it make me feel better. I've gotten better at something while playing ice hockey. And so therefore, there's a mastery component to it. Maybe I mastered, I don't know, a slap shot. And, mm -hmm. and in that game, I just, I had a great one. So I feel better. But, you know... Exercise can also be really tough, right? I lift weights and sometimes it's just not enjoyable. And so mm -hmm. I think the type of exercise you do has an enjoyment factor. I think whatever the stressors are in your life, if you want to talk extremes, in the middle of, at least in the U.S., you know, and in Boston within the U.S., I should say, you know, we were in our houses for over a year. To go down to my basement and lift weights in a dark, dingy basement and come back, yeah, I felt like I did something, but it didn't really make me feel better. I mean, mm -hmm. I still going back to my living room, right? And where I hadn't seen anyone other than my family in months, you know, or if there's, you know, really stressful and clinically stressful things in your life, maybe the type of exercise or dose of exercise just isn't enough. But the hope is, is that it is. And so that's why there's all kinds of different research that's going on now where we're looking at clinical therapies that include exercise. Um, in my own world, we haven't begun this line of work, but we're really, really interested. Myself and one of my colleagues, uh, Sue Whitfield-Gabrielli, we're really interested in seeing if we can in include high-intensity interval training in hospitals in children who have been admitted for suicidal ideology. So mm -hmm. maybe we're not thinking it will solve that problem, but we're thinking it might alleviate it temporarily, allowing them to receive other therapies. And the synergism between being physically active for a brief period of time with cognitive behavioral therapies or other therapies that they use, pharmacological, whatever it might be, maybe there's some benefit there. Okay. And speaking of those two kinds of exercises, so weightlifting and typically aerobic exercise that is running, uh, from what I've heard, these two exercises have very different pleiotropic effects on the brain. And generally, aerobic exercises are preferred to weightlifting, for example. How does it look with children? Yeah, Dominic, this is, a, this is a really good question. I would say this, that aerobic exercise isn't preferred overall. It's just more studied. You know, we know a lot more about aerobic exercise than we do about strength training. For instance, there's a great line of work at the University of British Columbia by a, a professor named uh, Teresa Lambros, who uses strength training interventions in older adults and has terrific benefits in brain structure and function, executive function and all that. But in kids, you know, particularly the kids I study who are pre-adolescent, you know, they're pre-pubital. And so strength training isn't advised for those children. Now, body weight training, which is strength training, right? Um, so push-ups, sit-ups, you know, anything they're moving their body around, bone-loading exercises like jumping, that's all recommended as well. But at least the work in my lab doesn't demonstrate any benefit in kids of strength training at that early age. Now, we have work in, in young adults that shows acute bouts of strength training benefit working memory, right? And so I think different exercise for different periods of the lifespan is probably what we're looking at here and, and we need to unravel all those pieces. Another thing that came to my mind is that at the time when we are children, our minds are very malleable and so are our brains. So are there any long-term benefits that stem from having a physically active childhood? So were there any longitudinal studies conducted on these children later in their lives? Yeah, and this is exactly why I got into this, you know, this field is that, you know, I think what we're talking about here are critical periods of the life span, critical periods of brain development. These are periods where the brain is especially susceptible to intervention. And, you know, I, I can't claim to know what those periods are, but we know that during childhood, 
and early childhood, the brain is developing more rapidly than any other period of life. And so the thought might be that if, if we can intervene with some health behavior at a critical period, there stands a greater potential for long-term benefit. Now, having said that, there's no great study that I can point to and say, aha, we measured these people at 5, 10, all the way up through, you know, 85 years old. But there, there have been some studies. There, there was a study somewhere in Europe, it might have been Finland, I could be wrong on that. This came out about 10, 12 years ago, uh, that measured a million people. And they measured them at 18 years old. You know, say so decades of data. This was at the age, it was your, your military service period. And so what would happen is, is, you know, they had physical fitness measures on all these people. Then they went back and tried to find as many of them as they could in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and showed that those that were more fit at 18 were more cognitively healthy at, in their later adulthood. But they didn't necessarily take into account that they may have the lifestyles throughout their adult lives as mm -hmm. fit as they were in their childhood. That's correct. They didn't. But, you know, they, they were able to grab a snapshot at a period and make predictions about that snapshot 50 years later. But no, there is no longitudinal study that measured fitness in children in, in early childhood or, or even middle childhood and then followed them throughout their lives. The general belief from the work we've put together in kids and adults as a field is a user loses it philosophy. Meaning if, if no matter how fit you are, no matter how much benefit you get, if you stop exercising, it will go away. I want to discuss one hypothesis. Do we have a research, or maybe we can just discuss this topic as something what can happen in, in life, when someone had really, really inactive childhood mm -hmm. and youth, and then they started to work out as an adult. Do we see any spectacular changes in their brain? Absolutely. So mm -hmm. um, I, I think you're never too old to derive the benefit. I can't point to specific studies, but in the aging work I've done over the last 20 years, I can tell you that a good number of, of the participants, uh, maybe if they were active early in their lives, were inactive for decades and decades and decades and then come to us in their mid-60s to engage in a physical activity intervention, either because their doctor told them they need to be more active or because maybe they want the money, and they derive benefit. And, you know, in some regards, it's easier to demonstrate benefit in people who are sedentary, right, or, or most sedentary, because they show the largest gains in the beginning, and they drive that, that early benefit. The ones who are, you know, pretty moderately physically active, that they're getting closer to that ceiling. And so it's possible that they don't derive as much benefit. We don't know. I would actually want to make a slight throwback because you were talking about research brewing regarding children with suicidal ideation. And speaking kind of out of heart to our listeners who may experience similar problems, who may be clinically depressed or otherwise because depression and other mood disorders have a particular effect on attention allocation and also on sure. our motivation. So would you say there are some life hacks, quote unquote, to kind of going around that problem when you don't have uh, the energy to engage in physical activity or you cannot master enough attention to start exercising? Would you say there are some ways of possibly solving that problem? Yeah, that's a tough question. And that's, that's certainly a question that the field has discussed. And, and it's, you know, it's written out in papers. I mean, I, I can't say strongly enough, you know, if, if you suffer from affective disorders and clinical mental health issues, particularly suicidal ideology, I mean, I think, you know, you need to seek doc, you know, medical help. I think that's at a very beginning basis of, of where everything starts. I, I think to answer your question... It's really difficult, and I don't think that anyone would ever recommend mental illness, mental health, physical you know, well-being, whatever it might be, to go from zero to 100, right? And so oftentimes, you know, when I've worked with, with people and we, or when we've developed physical activity interventions, like for instance, we develop physical activity interventions in, in older adults, we literally increase their dose every time they come back by just one minute or two minutes and just by a few percentage points of intensity. So the idea is that you start start small, start low intensity. If you set out to walk one minute at a, a moderate pace and you do that you know, every day for a week, well, when the week's up and day eight comes along, 
you can do two minutes, right? At that intensity, you can go another week. There's no rush to get there. It's just a matter of starting it and developing a program that's as slow or as fast as you need it to be to get to where you need to be to actually derive the benefit. The, the other thing I'd point out is that exercise is not the same for everyone. You know, uh, I think of my stepfather, he, he jogged every day. That was what he did. I love ice hockey. I can't play ice hockey every day, right? I mean, I have to do other things. I have to run my, I have to run my mountain bike. You know, I have to play ice hockey. I have to lift weights. And I think that for others of us, maybe who aren't as good with our attention, maybe we have to mix it up all the time. You know, we have a saying in the US, you know, there's, a, there's many ways to skin a cat. And I think it's true. There's many ways to be physically active. And if you don't want to go out and structure physical activity into your daily life, then build it into your daily life. Take the stairs instead of the elevator. Park the car a little further away. Decide to, to actively commute somewhere once a week instead of getting in your car. And so you can do these things in your everyday life and hopefully derive benefit. It doesn't always have to be a structured long-term, highly intense bout of exercise. One last question. Is it safe to say that it is better to have some incremental and generally more consistent routine of exercise than having certain bouts of helpful leather exercise that are very intense? I, I don't think we know. I can tell you that one of the hottest areas of research in my field is high-intensity interval training. We've shown that a single dose of 20 minutes of walking in children benefits brain function and cognition and academic achievement. We've shown that that eight minutes of hit has the same benefit. And so there, again, there's a lot of ways to get there. And I think the best way to be physically active and to benefit physical and brain health is to vary your exercise. And so I certainly wouldn't recommend hit all the time. And you wouldn't recommend hit to a 75 year old person without medical supervision, right? And in that case, getting them to walk 30 minutes after dinner is, is a great achievement. And so I think you have to look at the individual, you have to look at what their interests are, you have to see what makes them feel good, as we discussed, and, and go from there. Okay. I think that we need to end right here. I just want to really, really thank you for the conversation, but also with the all life knowledge you brought here in this conversation. I want to thank you in our name and in the name of our listeners. Thank you. It Thanks was really a great pleasure to have you here. Thank you.